Good morning. It's 8.30, and I'm calling Clay Court County Board of Commissioners meeting for June 25th, 2024 to order. First item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. We have two changes to it. We're going to move item 12 to the top of the agenda, and we're also going to add uh, request permission to partner with Clay Soil and Water Conservation District on Habitat, and Habitat Enhancement Landscape Pilot Grant. Uh, that will be added um, after uh, it'll become item, or it'll be handled after item five. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as described? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as described. Second. Have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, next we have citizens to be heard. Are there any citizens present? who want to uh, speak on an item that is not on our agenda. Do we have any citizens online, Steve? We do not, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next on the agenda is approval of the payment of bills and vouchers. I move to pay the voucher. Second. A motion second, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Next is approval of minutes from June 11, 2024. Move approval. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Okay, next, we will start with uh, Darren Brooks, our HR director, who has got to go down and man the grills for our employee picnic so we're going to get them out of here early all right thank you mr chair and thanks for reminding everybody that today is the county picnic um it'll be on the south side of the family service center and from 11 30 to one o'clock we have our uh world famous chef kurt cannon still cooking our hamburgers so chef uh, and dancer <laughs> yeah and uh so uh it's going to be a great day for that uh, we hope everybody comes out and uh and has a few, few burgers and pulled pork and a lot of other good things um so i'm here today uh as you know for the past i think 11 or 12 years the state runs a performance measurement program <coughs> and each year uh we decide uh, the board decides to participate in that and as you can see from your packet uh, it's a lot of the different areas that uh, we keep track of stats and statistics for the the county and each department contributes to this report. I, I'm the one that just puts it together for the uh, uh, for the state. And so what I'm here to request permission to uh, participate, continued participating for the 2024 report, which will be due July 1st of 2025. The, the uh, resolution that you have in the back uh, is that re resolution to continue this program. Um, in dis and, and we do get paid by the state for uh, participating in this program. And for uh, the 2022 program, we received um, $9,494 from the state in December of 2023. And then we will just we will get uh, 2023's money at the end of 2024. So um, with that being said, uh, the only correction I have on your agenda item sheet is the implementation timeline. Um, I will send the 2023 report to the state auditor to by, by July 1st, not July 2nd, uh, when it when it's due. So that being said, uh, I'm open for questions. Any questions for Darren? No, I think it's a good program that we're doing, so I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. Okay, thank you. I'll second. A motion to second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank, thank you, Darren. Thank you. It will be posted on the county website for 90 days so the citizens can see it as well. Very good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, next up we have, uh, let me get current here. Rory Schmidt is uh, here a request approval to hire one full-time employee and cybersecurity analyst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. 
so as uh, Commissioner Ebinger mentioned, we I'm here today to request a uh, new position. It would be a full-time position for a cybersecurity analyst. Uh, this position would be responsible for handling all things cybersecurity at the county and coordinating efforts with uh, the existing team and technology services along with uh, data loss prevention for the county and uh, working with each of the department heads to ensure that uh, electronic compliance is met across uh, the organization. So to uh, give a little recap here, uh, for the 2024 budget, uh, it was approved by the board to add a new request of $85,000 for a, a new security product, a security monitoring event solution. And the, the product we were shooting for ultimately was uh, declined by the Minnesota BCA due to uh, lack of compliance in, on the product's part. So we went back to the drawing board, um, demoed nine or ten different security solutions, ultimately settling on one that was, um, for this first year, 2024, was $33,413 which left us a difference of 51, 000, roughly $51,000 out of that 85 that was approved. So the request would be to use the remainder of that money for this year to hire this uh, cybersecurity analyst. And then going forward, um, so in fiscal year 2025, there'd be roughly $62,000 available out of that 85 to potentially put towards this position. I guess that would be, that would be up to the or to decide if we could uh, move that money around from professional services over to salaries. And then in 2025, the, the remaining balance for that, uh, out of that $62,000, uh, the new position costs, there'd be roughly thirty dollars to $43,000 left over, which I would like to use um, some of our caseworks balance since that'll be going away at the end of this year. So we'd have a little bit of money in that fund to. Uh, to help offset the cost of this position. And then in 2026, that caseworks balance would ultimately be uh, going away or reserved for other, other items or other funds. And then the, the ask would be in 2026 that the remainder of that new position cost be uh, added as a increase to my budget. Any questions on that? And just, I do want to uh, note that this went before pick, and we forwarded it on um, for the for the full commission. Um, just as kind of a timeline, this was was enlightening to me. Could you describe the personnel numbers that you've had over the years? Basically, what I understood from pick is that there's never been an increase in your staffing. But there has been decreases. There, there has been increases. Um, was about four years ago, we hired a systems administrator, and then the following year, there was also a computer support specialist added. So total, with myself included, there's nine of us in technology services. So this would be a, a, a tenth person in the position. You've had cutbacks before. I wouldn't say cutbacks. No, we've, uh, we've we've tried to lower our our budget as much as possible. But okay, I think I'm confusing this with another item we have. You're right. Okay. Okay. But your workload has increased, and staffing's been fairly security. So yeah, cybersecurity wise, and just security in generals, just with different uh, criminal justice policies, HIPAA policies. You know, we're going through that uh, security posture assessment with social services now. It's just all of that just seems to be really increasing here in the last couple of years, and I don't see it slowing down at all. Okay. Any questions? Did you have questions, Frank? I was just going to say that we did uh, discuss this at uh, PIC, and uh, because of that cybersecurity we had last year, uh, we felt it was necessary to fill this position. And <clears throat> Mr. Commissioner Campbell. Ray, the, um, the Previous product that we had approved was the eighty-five thousand, and now you're saying for the remainder of twenty twenty-four, uh, we could get that f roughly fifty-one thousand. Yep. Fifty-one thousand. Yep. Okay. Because I'm. Uh, 
in here I'm sure, I'm seeing a thirty three thousand four thirteen. Oh, sorry, that that was the total cost of the product plus onboarding and training for for this year for the the new product, the replacement product, okay. which would leave a balance of fifty one. Okay, so you're talking about the balance. Yeah, and yes. I was talking about the cost of the product. Sure. Yep. So, so then, year, so, year two of that product, um, yeah. it actually lowers because there's no onboarding and training costs. So okay. next year we're it's okay. looking around $23,000 for that renewal. And it, um, does that product have any, are there users involved with that or is it just a standard? Fee, whether you have right yeah so it's it, not like a it, license thing where we have to buy so many licenses it, it is based on device or server or workstation um, that, that's the licensing model um, we're actually paying the perpetual licensing model not the subscription which is uh, a little bit cheaper for us overall especially if we keep it in the long term I guess we felt that the pick that just one cybersecurity attack on the county is going to be worth this position. So yeah, and I, and I will mention, you know, just having this position isn't going to eliminate the, the, the right. possibility of this right. happening to us right. again. Right. But it's the idea is to reduce the risk. And I make a motion that we approve this. A second, a motion and a second. Are you needing a backfill on this potentially? Uh, unsure at this time. Okay, should we include that in the motion in case he needs a backfill? Okay, I'll, I'll include that. Fine. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, Rory. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up. We got Sheriff Empting and Chief Deputy Chris Martin coming up. Um, approve hiring of one full-time deputy due to retirement. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Thanks for having us this morning. Um, I was informed last week um, that um, Deputy Janelle Roggenbach <coughs> has indicated her intent to retire on September 20th, 2024 of this year. Janelle's been with us for uh, over 33 years. She's been assigned to the Warrants and Transports Division. She has done an excellent job there. And um, she's definitely earned her long retirement, hopefully long retirement. And um, we're just looking to uh, replace this position. This would not be a need for a backfill position or anything like that. We would be uh, looking to advertise through the post board and to take applications uh, once approved by the board. Any questions for the sheriff? Make a motion to approve. Okay. And motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, just a, sheriff, is, is the intent that the new person that you hire would move into this role? Or are you going to make some shifts? Um, that would probably. That probably depend on who's interested in this particular role. There's always shifts like this. Generally, um, it would probably be somebody that's going to go on patrol, and then somebody currently working would move into this role. It just all depends on who's interested. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Have motion to second on the floor. So, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. You're up on the next one too, Sheriff. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you um, for this. I'm giving you another 2024 squad car update. These are never ending, it seems like. Um, it, of course, the past history is we ordered six cars for 2024. Enterprise said we were only going to get two. We ended up finding Durango's. We got um, some Durango's and an additional Tahoe. Um, I was contacted here. Oh, probably four to six weeks ago by Enterprise, they indicated that the cars that we uh, ordered um, for 2024 and that were in were mistakenly ordered black instead of the white. So they had asked the dealership what they were going to do about that. The dealership had said, well, we'll find them a white car. They magically found a white car. And then they said, well, you've still got this other car on order. If you would like to take possession of that car as well, you can do that to add an additional car to the fleet. Um, I did have a 2022 that, I mean, we 
we could we could replace. Um, I did not have it in the original request because the deputy felt that his car would be fine. It's a, it's a car that's assigned to Lieutenant Josh Schroeder. He felt that his assignment would be just fine and he could keep his car another year. Uh, if approved by the board, what I would end up doing is replacing Deputy Schroeder's car and then using his car as an additional spare car, as it seems like we're always down in our fleet right now, uh, just due to mechanical issues, hitting wildlife, things of that nature. Uh, also attempting to plan for the future and hope um, working with our county administrator and Justin Sorum that when we get that uh, MnDOT building out in Holly, we'd be able to put a spare car out there as we do have uh, several deputies that do live on the east end of the county and they would be able to have a car uh, available to them if they were to drop their car off at a shop on the east end. Um, I, I think this is a good plan uh, moving forward. As you can see, uh, internal service funds we have available for uh, our, our 2022 car is 62761 uh, The estimated costs are in there with the emergency equipment, the cost of upfitting, the in-car camera, and I indicated on there that would be the in-car camera only. I'm not looking for cloud storage on that. Just due to it being a spare, we would not need cloud storage. And then the one-year lease of approximately 47585 also, if this car does come in 2024, which is a good possibility that it does, we have uh, saved approximately $12,876,000 um, for the 2024 because we have not taken delivery of those two Tahoes that are currently at North Country in Hibbing. So we do have a savings there. If uh, it comes in early, let's say it's six months early, that would cost us an additional $7,600 so there are funds available for that as well. Questions for the sheriff? Mr. Just, <clears throat> just for clarification, every car you're working with is still on the lease program, right? Um, uh, of the new of the new, new ones, ones, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. They're still on the lease program. Right, including the one you're talking about. Including this one as well. Yeah. That follows the, the one year lease here. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Well, it makes sense to me, so I'll make a motion that we re uh, approve the request. Second. A motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Good luck. Keep, keep uh, bringing them in when you can find them. We'll do that for sure. I did receive an email on Friday from Enterprise that apparently a large southern agency somewhere um, could not take delivery of the cars they ordered, and that was 40 Tahoes and 20 Silverados. Oh. Unfortunately, they're not the right color for us. They're uh, sterling gray, and per state statute, they have to be a specific color for patrol, and that does not work for us. Yep. So, but they're out there. Keep hunting. Thank you. All right. You can take Matt. Not to hear him, but the yeah, other. Yeah, we'll... we'll uh, yeah. Matt, if you want to cover the other items you've got before the <clears throat> the one item, the agenda item that we've added. The hearing. Good not ready for the chair and yep. commissioners, would you like me to cover the addition or the the, the agenda addition. The agenda addition, okay. He, he does have a, a third item with he has the public hearing. He has the addition, and then he also you're doing the memorial for us. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yep. We can we can start with the agenda item, and if you have time, we'll do the memorial forest. Sounds good. Well, thank you, um, and thank you for uh, your willingness to entertain this um, agenda item at such short notice. Uh, just kind of found out about it yesterday, and it seems like a fantastic opportunity for both the SWCD and for the county. Uh, this is a, a grant opportunity through uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources and um, essentially what it would be is providing funding to uh, establish or restore or enhance uh, pollinator habitat um, in the county. And similar to what was done out at the Crestwood site. Um, and so looking at the SWCD is kind of the lead on this, and they're they're taking the the the, fisc, they're the fiscal agent essentially on this, and 
um, they'll be providing, there's a, a match that they would be providing in terms of funding and then also technical assistance as well. Um, and so what this, this grant opportunity would allow us to do is allow us to uh, develop a number of our county flood buyout properties uh, and for pollinator habitats similar to, to Crestwood. And um, what the benefits that I see for the county in doing this, um, in addition to providing more opportunities for county residents to enjoy some lovely native vegetation, uh, is um, reduce one number one would be reduced maintenance costs. Um, we're starting to see where we're going to have where we're having to maintain these properties more regularly with mowing and spraying, and um, with Crestwood, what we found is we don't really have the mowing and spraying uh, costs that we would with some of our other uh, properties in Crestwood that don't have that that uh, that pollinator habitat, mm -hmm. and so my request today would be to just partner with the, the SWCD and um, select uh, probably up to 10 sites uh, to, to serve kind of as the, the land for, for this uh, pollinator habitat development. Any questions for me at all? Questions for Matt? I would say anything we can do to help the butterflies uh, yeah. is appropriate, so I make a motion to approve it. I'll second with a note. Uh, again, uh, when we've had the solar water meetings, uh, this has come up several times uh, over the last month or so. And uh, uh, certainly um, the idea that they see all the benefits that um, Matt just talked about. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Good for the butterflies. Yes. And we still have time, Matt, for you to cover the uh, request approval of Memorial Forest Utility Easement. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. So this request is uh, from Midco, and they are asking for a uh, utility easement um, on our Memorial Forest property. I kind of have it I pulled up here on your screen so you can see where exactly that is. So we're looking at two locations, um, kind of right off 44 and 10, and then down um, towards the, the railroad bridge there. And, and the ask for this is to bring uh, fiber optic um, internet to Buffalo River State Park. And so that's kind of the reason that they're asking for this. Uh, attorney's office has reviewed um, the easement, they don't have any issues with it at all. Uh, it's very similar to the easement that was approved for uh, Red River Valley Co-op Power uh, a year or two ago. Um, the one, I think, main thing in here that we made sure to include was that if there were gonna be any trees or vegetation that needed to be cut down, that they would seek uh, county approval first, just because this being the Memorial Forest, we wouldn't want a tree that's part of the Memorial Forest to be cut down. Any questions for me at all on this? Questions for Matt? I, I do a little bit. <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I don't understand what's the connection between the northern easement and the southern. What You're showing two easements. Yep. Okay, just see, maybe I missed it. Why, why are there two separate eas easements? So, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Crabben, I have to think. But the the reasoning is, is they can use kind of existing right away for the remainder of that easement. Oh. These are just the areas where they would require some work to be done, um, either in terms of setting up like a a box or something like that. Okay. Um, but they just it wouldn't it would be outside that right away. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly in favor of going in, and then this area that I'm just curious. I know it's just a overview looking down is that near a river channel or what's that lighter shade down here yeah no it's just river. different trees yeah like okay. aspen just curious yep okay. poplar trees Thanks. any other questions mr i move approval of the grant to easement really easement grant second a motion second further discussion 
If not all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Matt, you're too good. Let's take a five minute break and then nine o'clock we'll open the public meeting. Okay, it's nine o'clock, we're back in session. Uh, next item is uh, a public hearing for Splunkowski Holdings Limited request uh, for a major platted subdivision. Make a motion to open public hearing. Second. Have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, we're in public hearing. If you would, uh, Matt, uh, proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. This is a requ request for a seven lot residential subdivision. The name of the plat would be Hay Creek Meadows subdivision. I would be on a 60, roughly almost 68 acre parcel. This is just south of um, Downer. It's on the east side of Trunk Highway 9. Uh, the zoning of the parcel is agricultural general. Currently it's used pr pr for pasture. There's some wetlands on the property. Uh, there's like a gr old gravel pad and a shed on the property as well. Um, in this area where there were sh where there's trees, there's a kind of a history of, uh, of gravel mining. So it was a gravel pit in, in the past. So the comprehensive plan goals and objectives relative to this subdivision request in our residential goal category, we have a goal to provide opportunities for quality resident rural residential development in Clay County. Uh, the objectives on which this goal is implemented is through implementing residential density standards that allow for rural residential development while retaining the rural character of Clay County, permitting large lot non-farm residential development if a portion of the property is preserved or converted to a use that retains the rural character of the land and to avoid or mitigate residential development on or near environmentally sensitive lands or lands with high quality natural resources. So from our development code, um, land division, by a plat is required whenever you're making um, one or more non-residential lot or three or more lots um, that would be residential. I just want to pull up the, this was the preliminary plat. It's kind of hard to see. And I'll get to the final plat here. Um, the, not many changes were necessary to the, to the preliminary plat. Uh, regarding uh, soils, um, looking at one thing we look at with um, uh, when looking at these residential subdivisions, especially if farmland is being converted, is looking at the, um, uh, I guess, the agricultural value of the land. And so looking at this just based on our, our land classification um, for pr prime farmland, uh, as well as the crop equivalency rating, which basically is a measure of how um, economically productive the, the land would be for agriculture. They're all, it's all very pretty low on this parcel. So not a whole lot of ag value here. In terms of wetlands, there are some wetlands scattered throughout the property, mainly in the northeast. Um, most of these, especially kind of in the center, central part of, of the parcel, are kind of remnants from uh, gravel mining. And then soils, um, looking at soils really uh, not only for construction, but also for um, uh, septic drain fields. So like a lot of Clay County, uh, not very good absorption in these soils, um, so which requires like a kind of an at grade or half mound system. So fortunately there are ways to, to mitigate against uh, poor soils with septic. Uh, in terms of setbacks, um, this, all of the lot proposed lots in this subdivision would meet all the, the setbacks and there'd be ample room for uh, residential development. What the uh, developer plans to do is uh, seven residential lots. The average of each of these lots would be eight and a half acres. There would be three accesses off Trunk Highway 9 for lots one through four. Um, lots three and four would share an access. There'd be three accesses off 100th Avenue South. Um, there would be private sewer and water. Uh, the, the applicant or the developer did get uh, some well testing done. So there was an existing well on one of the lots uh, pumping at a rate of 100 gallons per minute. 
kind of our minimum that we look for with a new residential development is five gallons per minute, so well above that. Um, they also tested for contaminants, uh, and then everything looked good there except, of course, arsenic. So some mitigation would have to be done there in terms of um, arsenic mitigation. And then they do have uh, restrictive covenants. Uh, the restrictive covenants essentially um, would, would dictate kind of what the minimum size of homes, no mobile homes, things like that. Making sure that they're following the, the county code for um, if they're going to be any keeping of animals on residential parcels or anything like that. Matt, while I got you on this page, um, the three accesses off of Trunk Highway 9, is that something that MnDOT would have to approve? They have already approved those accesses, yep. There was a change, there, was, uh, there are already two accesses on there, so they approved a new one, and then they did a change of use, essentially, for the, for the other accesses. Thank you. Yep, and the applicant did provide those approvals with his um, application. Uh, we did get some comments at the Planning Commission public hearing from Elkton Township. They had some concerns on 100th Avenue South. Um, basically, there isn't any winter maintenance on 100th Avenue South, but uh, speaking with Justin and the Highway Department is, is able to do pick up the winter maintenance on, on 100th Avenue South. There's also kind of an old dumping ground on the property, so it was kind of used as a gravel pit back in the late 30s through the 70s, half gravel pit, half um, makeshift landfill for Elkton Township residents only to kind of dump their garbage. A lot of that was hauled off when they reclaimed the, the gravel pit to the, land, to the landfill. Um, I will say this is probably an 8,500 square foot site. Uh, the developer has actually tested both the water and he's done, they've done soil borings uh, just to see what the if there's any issues from leaching of any contaminants or any environmental concerns asso as associated with that old site, um, and that all tested negative. Um, they know exactly where it is, and he plans on including it on the seller disclosures as well. And so I just want to pull up the... What line is that on? I think that's up here, so... And I can let the developer speak to it, but lot three, I want to say. Okay. So this is, I'll try and zoom in here on the plat. So we've got lots five, six, and seven kind of running on 100th Avenue South here. And then one through four would all have access off of um, Trunk Highway 9. There is an easement on this um, as well, just an access easement to the to the property over here. I should should note, um, and one of the that kind of influenced the design of or the layout of this lot, just to keep that easement all on on one lot. Any questions for me at all? Questions for Matt, mm -hmm. Mr. Krabenoff. Uh, just a couple of minor things, just. Um, just to refresh my mind. So when we have a delineated wetland, what's the setback for, is that 100 and? Be 50 feet. It's 50 feet? Yep. Okay. And then- I'm gonna the call that the mosquito buffer too. <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> okay. And they're big, big lots, so. Yes. I mean, obviously, yep. they're in the impact. You said those, they were, um, most of those are from gravel mining? The wetlands, the areas where they were dug? Yeah, I think a portion of the, especially because the gravel mining kind of ran through <laughs> kind of this northeast um, and central kind of part of the, the parcel. Sure. Yeah, it's kind of, it's very interesting if you go back and look at downer from uh, aerial curious, maps from the 30s and 40s. Wet? Do they stay wet or is they, are they just more cattle? That would be a great question for the okay. um, developer. It's curious. Yep. And then uh, uh, back to the township road. If we maintain that, how is that, uh, I'm, just for my knowledge, how are those costs maintained? I mean, who pays for that? How, how, how does that work? That would just go into the, con to the contract with the township because the, the highway department already does this, the summer maintenance and graveling on that. So just picking up the plowing too. Okay. It's just been an extra mile for 
Elkton Township. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it'd be, it'd be, so if it's a no winter maintenance road right now, it's an hourly contract. And so if they take it off of no winter maintenance and becomes a regular uh, contract, then it would, they would get the annual rate, which is probably in some many ways uh, more affordable anyway. By doing it that way, so. But that's on the township. That's on the township, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? I got one on the covenant. I don't know if we can cover that yet or not, but uh, I know item number seven says vehicles must be stored neatly and have current registration at all times. I mean, is that a requirement? You, uh, if you have a vehicle on there, say you have an antique vehicle, you don't, you're not using. Would have to be registered all the time. So, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Gross, are in our current code, you can essentially have two non-licensed, uh, uninsured, and non-roadworthy vehicles per property. Um, if you have more than that, they would have to be stored inside. Essentially, we don't allow the outdoor storage of parts either. So, it's roughly in line with our code. As covenants can be more restrictive than the county code as well. I just thought that was pretty restrictive, you know, that they have to be registered all the time. Yeah, and that that would be a that would be a developer choice for that because it's a kind of a private agreement, essentially the restrictive covenants. I thought that was pretty restrictive, but very good. Any other questions for Matt? Do we have anyone here that wants to speak to this issue? Develop, developer possibly. If you would just step up and give your name and address to there at the podium. Bill Splinskowski, I'm with Splinskowski Holdings. You want my address? You, said? you need the address, Sarah? Yes. 17252, 280th Street North, Eulen, Minnesota. Um, we did go to Elkton Township meeting last night and uh, they signed the plat. And uh, we had to talk about the winter maintenance and all that, and they were on board with everything. Everything was good. So um, they did talk to the highway department. It sounded like there's possibly some brush that had to be removed along our property that would hold snow, um, and maybe have to re-landscape the ditch. Um, cause there's not much of a ditch for uh, maybe about 100 or 200 yards there. But, uh, but they signed off on everything, and uh, everything was good to go. They also gave us the permits for the accesses along the north side. We have a copy of their minutes from the meeting from that. So. Questions from Mr. Spunkowski? Just Commissioner up. Krabinoff? So were they were, were those, uh, where that area was mined? I'm just curious, do they hold water or are they more cattails or? Yeah, so the area through the center where you see it was mined, it's, it's all trees, it's like 50 foot trees. And that's actually not really the low area. The low area is off in the northeast corner. Um, that's kind of the low area. It's seasonally wet. Oh, yeah. um, like when we got all that rain this spring, um, there was one hole where they had dug out. Um, there, was, there was a little bit of water in that. But I, I think the, the soil and water called it seasonable or seasonal something or other. Normally they're all dry. Even the spring, there was oh, yeah. only one hole where they had dug down about 10 feet. Yeah. They had some water in the bottom of it. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's that sandy loam. It seem, doesn't seem really seem to hold the water. Yeah. Commissioner Campbell. Just a, um, a comment here in reviewing the packet. I noticed at the very back of your, the packet there's a Hay Creek Meadows restrictive covenants. Um, it's, it's been my long understanding that uh, from a government standpoint, we do not recognize restrictive covenants. Uh, that's something that I think that is amongst landowners, and if there becomes disputes in that, that goes to a, a court for, for you know, clarification and not not planning and zoning or any of that nature. So I think it's just a, just a, for the record, even though that this has been submitted as a um, document within the application, um, we have no jurisdiction over restrictive covenants at the government level. Am I correct in that, Brian? Yeah. I, yeah, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Campbell, really, it's there is actually a, a, a quote unquote enforcement mechanism within typically within restrictive covenants. Covenants that basically state exactly what you just said is that the 
the residents of the subdivision have the um, privilege and the um, to um, enforce these covenants. And sometimes the developer can be involved in that too. And that's all would be all done civilly. That's right. It's, yep, and it and, just and gives. I, that's the only point I was trying to make is that yep. if there's ever a dispute amongst the uh, regarding the restrictive covenants, that hand that's handled through a, a civil process and yep. not through uh, county planning and for enforcement. Yep. Okay. I thought of it in my understanding that we were required to put them on the required to have them. I thought we were. Yeah. So to we have have, it's it's a requirement of the code to have covenants, and essentially what that does is it gives. What it does is it gives the residents basically a legal mechanism to handle any any issues. Right. So it's kind of a Inside the county to cover to cover yeah liability from there. So, yep. I guess what we tried to do with them, we what we did is there's another development about two miles away. Mm -hmm. um, we got a copy of theirs um, along with another one, and we took the pieces. We tried to. It's rural life. People move to the country typically because they want more in, more independence and freedom. So we tried to walk that fine line between keeping peace with your neighbors yeah. and still having that freedom. This is kind of what we came up with. I, I mean, I mean they're, I'm not saying they're a bad thing. I'm just saying that when they're, if there becomes a dispute, yeah. the resolution of that dispute is not handled through planning and zoning. It's handled through a, a civil process where they would have to take somebody to court. Right. Commissioner Gross. I just have one question. I think it's a great idea. I mean, but the lots are eight and a half acres. Are they, is that a requirement they have to be that big, or is that something you you want? It's eight and a half acres. Isn't that's a seems to be a big lot to buy to put a house on. It, it is a big lot. Um, a lot of my family, they're they're into horses and livestock. Typically, when you get people that live in the rural setting, you want livestock. Yeah. Um, you, you want more than five acres. Um, if you look, and there's also rules from the county about how many animal units per acre. Right. And uh, typically, if you're, if, you're looking, if you're trying to sell lots to the equestrian area or people who want to have a few cows, you need to have more than five acres. And that was our goal. Um, it's really close. It's 15 minutes from Moorhead, two miles from Interstate, but it's beautiful rural no. Clay County. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's perfect prime horse country. I think it is a great idea. I mean, but uh, I thought there were big lots if you just want to put a house on there. But they are for big. your purpose, it's, yeah. it's great. I mean, it's, I just wanted to thought they were big lots. Any other questions? Mr. Splunkowski. <laughs> Anything else, sir? We have anybody else who wishes to address the commission on this matter? Did Matt cover everything you needed to cover? Did you cover everything you needed to cover on this? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Campbell. Then, Mr. I move we close the hearing. Second. A motion to close the and a second to close the hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <clears throat> hey, we're out of the public meeting, back in our regular session. Move we approve the Hay Creek Meadows final plat based on the uh, Planning Commission recommendations. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next up, we have uh, Troy Amundsen, uh, Detox Director, with a presentation for us. <clears throat> Kathy McKay and Joe Olson. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, today, we're going to give you an update on our staffing and how that is going for the new facility. Joe's also joining us, and we'll discuss our transition plan and how we're going to um, tackle moving to our new facility when it's completed. So, um, last time we were here, we had a number of positions to fill, and we have um, actually been able to fill quite a few of them. And I can go through the list. It's it been updated um, since you received this uh, list, but. Um, 
So our, our case eight is filled. The detox LPNs, we currently now have 11 full-time and we're in need of two more. Uh, a variable hour employee has indicated an interest in uh, taking a position in August and we are working on setting up a interview with another LPN next week. So if both of those come through, um, we should be full of uh, LPNs for the new facility. <clears throat> um, as far as detox RNs, um, we've got three current ones and we do have another interview um, tomorrow actually for another position um, for the RN. Our techs, we currently have five. We're going to hire three more. We do have some uh, very qualified candidates that are currently very hour, so we'll be interviewing them and we should be able to fill from within um, and, and fill those positions. Our detox peer support, we're going to need three more variable hour staff. We currently have one person handling it now. Um, since um, we gave you this sheet, the LADC position is actually filled. We do have uh, a variable hour has decided that she would like to uh, move into the full-time position. So <clears throat> we will be full there and then we will just need to hire some variable hours to offset their hours on the weekends. Uh, RN team lead currently have one. We're going to need one more uh, team lead um, before we move over there. We haven't had any applicants yet for that. Uh, the same with the RN team supervisor. Um, that's been open for quite some time and we just have not had any qualified candidates apply for that position. So. And Mr. Chair and Commissioners, as in regards to the RN supervisor that's required, um, an RN must um, oversee the Nurse Practice Act of all the LPNs and, and staff there. So we cannot operate without the RN supervisor. I've been doing that um, over the years, um, qualified to oversee the Nurse Practice Act, work with the physician, um, you know, work with the medical um, um, protocols we're considered a clinically managed care, um, so we have to have that medical oversight. So that's a requirement. Um, I'm under the license of DHS, so continue to do that as long as there's the gap there. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll find somebody because it's a bit of work for both Troy and myself. Um, lots of things to, to oversee with that RN supervisor. So again, haven't had any success in recruitment for almost two years. So it's a position that's really, we're in dire need of. Oh, if we don't have that position filled, can we open? Yes, because I serve in that capacity. If, if I don't, Kathy, what's, what's making that so difficult to hire that position if it's um, you know the, That seems like a long time to be in search of a position. And, and we were in search of positions, if you recall, even in public health, there was a two year gap for us to get even case management RNs and RNs in our home visiting program. The RN market is tight and- Well, um, I fully understand that. I'm just wondering if, you know, what do we need to do? Well, salaries are, are one of the things. And of course, Darren with the market study, hopefully we'll come up with some um, salaries. We had an RN that was interested and her salary was at the end of our scale um, for our end, so we can't hire someone at the end of our scale. So seems to be a problem. Troy has been recruiting um, heavily and been using uh, the system called Indeed. That's where a lot of nurses are looking for positions, but we don't know what, what other than the salary, we haven't heard why we're not getting, should be someone out there that would want this position. That would be a daytime position, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, because we have the team lead, so they can cover some of the shifts. But you know, if there's a need, then the nurse supervisor would have to be available um, to take any um, anything that comes up. Um, I'm 24/7 anyway because of emergency preparedness, so I'd be available now. But the RN supervisor we would need available, just like Troy's available 24/7. So that'd be a requirement but not necessarily having to be in-house. Commissioner Kravinoff. Yeah, just a comment 
<clears throat> I'm certainly impressed with the number of hires you're getting. I don't know if you've been surprised by that, but you know, from someone looking on the outside in, it, knowing how uh, difficult it is in the nursing space to get people, I'm I'm impressed. And I'm just curious, uh, what if you can? What is the appeal that is, you know, brought these LPNs into this place? Or is there just a larger workforce, or is it the appeal toward, you know, the detox area? I'm just kind of curious. Other than working for Kathy and I? Yeah, <laughs> other than working for you two. The charm, I suppose there is some charm involved. You know, it, it, um, there's, there's interest in, in um, nursing for psych work, and this has a lot of psych involved in it. Um, so it's one of those things where it, it's hard to find them, but when you do find them, they are very interested. Um, a lot of nurses looking for a change. The, the one that I'll interview, um, an LPN and an RN, they're, they're both looking for change. Word of mouth, you hire, um, I, I just hired an LPN last week. She told an RN that she works with, and now we'll interview her tomorrow. Oh. So you, you see some of that trickle yeah. effect. Right. So. And Mr. Chair and Commissioner Kravinoff, the LPNs have not been difficult to recruit. As you can tell by yeah. um, mm -hmm. where our, our Troy is getting those, they've been much easier to recruit. Yeah. Just so you know, there's no retirement plans for you. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Campbell. So I, just to piggyback off of Commissioner Kravinoff's comments, I, you know, and I, 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 I'm going to make some assumptions that when you move into your new state-of-the-art facility that uh, the comparison to having the uh, work environment there versus your current site is going to have an impact on on your ability to hire as well. Yeah, I mean that's going to be a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. You know, when you consider the purpose of it, but it's still going to be it's going to have all the up, updated technologies and everything. That's I think it's going to be a benefit to you for your hiring process. Mm -hmm. and, and that has been a selling point when I talk to potential candidates. So, Yep, yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the real advantages we have is we're providing a service that's desperately needed for the entire region in a new facility that we're going to staff correctly, that's got the resources that professionals need to keep their clients safe, and to get them back on their feet. Yep. And you're right, it's got components. There's gonna be a lot of dual diagnosis people in there. They've got substance problems and mental health needs. Mm -hmm. yep. And this is, uh, you know, it's kind of like an emergency room. People go, oh my gosh, how can you work there? The people that do it love it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think this has got the same degree of, of uh, having a mission and having an opportunity to do it right. I hope people are listening out there, but this is a, and working for the county and work, you know, it's a good long-term career. So, yep. wish you luck on that. I'm glad you're making the advances you are. And I think once word gets out on this, I think people will be interested, hopefully. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, Joe. I just thought I'd jump in here a little bit uh, since they're talking staffing. Uh, Thought it was a good idea to just give you a quick update what we've done is um, we formed a transition team for the move of this building and um, what we did is uh, we formed a team that has Troy and Kathy and, and myself and um, uh, Mark Sloan who uh, deals with the communication side and then Rory on the technology side so we've, we've gotten together we've met once already and um, um, our goal or what we've really established is we really have four categories that we're working on right now and what and um, plan to put together a transition plan to bring to the July 8th meeting to update everybody and have the, the full committee there look at it and try to determine what we need but really our four categories so far that we've talked about is number one we've we've uh, identified that there are some inspections that are through DHS MDH um, that have to happen certain times one before the other before it happens and then um, um, uh, also, we were look, working with Gertz to make sure we get that occupancy by that date, too. So part of that transition team, we've added James from Gertz, um, as he knows the deadlines and, and 
then we can plan for them. So, so uh, inspections were really one important category for us. And the other one, uh, number two was um, Troy and Kathy, th their team has, you know, just operations. What do they have to do to move from one to the other site? And um, so they're working through their punch list. And then um, we, we have a third category, preliminary setup is what it is. And we're finding that the, the inside of the building will be done a month early uh, prior to the outside. And so um, that allows us to get in there and do a lot of pre-setup when it comes to setting up computers, furniture, FF&E, um, technology, working out the bugs, doing all that stuff. So it's really, we don't oftentimes get that. So, so we're going to capitalize on that and we're going to get in there and do that and um, go through that. So creating that punch list of what we can do ahead of time to make this easy. And then the fourth is just the move itself that day. So they're figuring out how do you, how do you uh, move your clients and everything. And then we're um, planning what we need to do to actually move everything. So just wanted to quick touch on all that, but we plan on putting a whole punch list together, bringing it to the committee for, uh, for further discussion and just to let you know we're thinking about it. So questions? Questions for Joe? As usual, it's just reassuring to hear our staff describe what they're doing. We know that we have competent, experienced people that are on this, and it's uh, it, it's it, it just adds the excitement. You know, I'm sure there'll be some glitches and surprises for all of us, but it's good to know you've got people on top of it. Mr. Joan, I'm assuming there's some. Um, some planning going on about the notif notification of other agencies and entities who might bring people to yes that yep. facility where all where all of a sudden it's going to switch. We don't want them yep. going to the old place. Yep, we uh, actually it's kind of a combination of Troy's team and working with um, MIS, also uh, also myself as managing the building at the FSC. So we between all of us we were going to post it over there. Uh, they're going to reach out to their their uh, People and then uh, we'll make sure we have it on the website uh, ahead of time too. So, yeah. but yes, we're working on that. Good. Any other questions? Really appreciate y'all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, you're still up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I can. Uh, eat. I kind of need them, maybe. <laughs> oh, well, next next we have Joe Olson with a request to approve or for approval to advertise a full time custodial position for the withdrawal management detox facility. Yes, I just I have the I have uh, Troy and Kathy here with me too for this. Um, of course, this is part of uh, one of our punch list transition is to make sure we have a custodian in place. Um, we budgeted last year; it was approved, um, and it's a full, one full time position. Uh, we did not hire her. We held off until obviously the building is open. So uh, we know that sometime towards the end of August we're going to need a custodian, and so we'd like to start advertising now. It usually takes, depending on background, um, could take a six weeks to two months. So we want to hire and get everybody and have somebody on staff by then. So I'm requesting to advertise for that. So. Any questions for Joe? Commissioner Campbell. Mr. Chair, um, Joel uh, is, uh, will that, will that full-time person be able to handle the DMV as well? Uh, um, no, what, what this is, this is eight, this is a full-time position that will be strictly to, to detox. Um, it, it's going to be a daytime position that works with Troy. Uh, we have, um, DMV staff already at the mall. And so we're going to be transitioning the, them over to the new building. So we do have enough at the mall to cover the new DMV. So there won't be a added cost to that. But um, definitely, we had an increase in size of the, the facility itself. There's uh, more than enough to do. So they're going to do their normal cleaning like we do any other building. But they're also going to kind of be there during the day if you know something happens. Troy needs a cleanup or whatever. So it's definitely going to be a, a, a needed position. Um, we do have. Uh, some variable hour backup type scenarios that we do that we use, you know, for either, you know, an RRC a variable hour or a, uh, or the, the DMVs to help backup type scenarios. But um, that is one dedicated position anyways to detox. So, yeah. so. Commissioner Krabinoff. Yeah, Joe, does it, 
Are you thinking someone brand new to the the whole system or for this spot and and or do you accept, expect someone you already have uh, typically, transitioning there and you're yeah. filling here? Right. Um, historically, we've promoted within. Uh, usually there's somebody that's worked their way up and yeah. is capable of doing that. So um, and being a daytime position too, that is a that's a highly sought after position too. So um, I not sure who wants it, but it, it definitely we have a good chance of seeing who internally would take it first. So, so um, I mean, good point you brought that up with with requesting to backfill exactly. if yeah. if we do. So, thank you for that. I'll make a motion to approve the hiring plus backfill, okay. if necessary. Second. I have motion to second, and it, it's going to include the backfill. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, folks. We need another break. Oh, no, it's still works out there. Well, are, they, are they here? Are they, they're, yep, they're, we're right on time. Okay. Can we? Hmm? we need a break. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Yeah. Okay, we are back in session. And next up we have uh, Dilworld City Manager Peyton Mastera and the Mayor Chad Olson here to present uh, the Dilworld Local op uh, Option Sales Tax presentation. Fill us in on what's going, to, uh, going towards getting the new community center built. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners, for having us this morning to present our upcoming local option sales tax referendum vote. And I'm actually going to turn the show over to the mayor to do the majority of the presenting. We're just starting our barnstorming tour right now of going around making our presentations. Did the first one last night. This is the second one. We're going to be the two main representatives doing this. So this is Chad's trial run right here. So be kind to him. <laughs> Thank you, Peyton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and com uh, Commissioners. We appreciate the time this morning, uh, and we will be judicious as we as we go through this. Uh, we do have a slide for questions at the end, but at any point in time, if you have questions, please uh, just let me know, and we'll answer them in step. Um, so, the City of Dilworth, we've made a commitment. We've been making a commitment. Uh, there's a tradition, a commitment to providing uh, amenities to our residents, and um, recently, we put forth of the public service uh, or public safety element. And we use, we're using our fire station as, as a catalyst, right? Um, our fire station is now under construction in the current area of our community center. And as a result, and our commitment to uh, investments in the amenities, um, we're really looking at our community center now to um, support the quality of life that our residents expect and deserve, just the amenities in, in town. Um, and this November, we are going to ask our residents to consider a half-cent sales tax to help fund our new community center project. And um, again, with this site, um, we're looking to use, it will better serve our growing population. Uh, a brief history uh, really focuses on the challenges of our former community center. Um, it was built four decades ago uh, with, with great intention, and it has served us well. Um, but we have identified deficiencies in our community center that include but are not limited to uh, the ability to support a wider range of activities, become more inclusive uh, to our growing community, uh, insufficient storage. Um, we did not have, uh, we were, the old community center was grandfathered in, so ADA restrooms, uh, the, the the restrooms were so severely uh, insuff in insufficient. Why could I not get that word out? Insufficient uh, as, as we've progressed over those 40 years. Our HVAC and mechanical was failing, and maintenance and repair uh, was you know, getting to the point where replacement is actually the most economically sound decision. Um, and as we look at this, uh, when we were talking about the new location, why move the community center was uh, is a frequent question. And we did have uh, a facilities assessment uh, done throughout the city of Dilworth and really concluded that the community center and fire station 
there was a safety and security issue uh, for coexistence. So the, the independent um, analysis came back and said that your best option for safety and security would be to separate the two, have your fire station in one location and community center in another. And that's the, the avenue that we have been following to this point. Um, when we're looking at uh, looking forward for the next 40 years, we are really looking towards um, growth in the center itself. Our first look is going to be um, focused on a community space, um, a usable space for various activities, um, areas for youth and senior programs, uh, adequate storage for future events, along with a modern, uh, large modern kitchen, and updated equipment and technology. That is our first step, and that's where we're going uh, initially. Uh, but we're going to build this, the, the plan is to build this with an opportunity for expansion. Um, taking a very pragmatic approach um, and keeping all things considered, especially a budget, um, the, the future for this community center will evolve it into a, like a community rec center where it will be able to include a walking track, uh, potential daycare, uh, fitness spaces, and other opportunities as it grows. Um, again, when we're looking at our next 40 years, we want to make sure that we have um, the ability to grow the center in a means that accommodates the needs of our, of our residents. And as such, pardon me, um, we looked at a, a future location that will provide for such growth. Um, initially, it has the resource that has the infrastructure necessary. Streets and, and water uh, are, are close, um, so we would not necessarily have to invest um, in additional infrastructure there. And then the site, as you can see, is highlighted in yellow. It will give us enough room to grow the center to include other amenities. Uh, again, as they're warranted and as the need and um, partnerships develop, um, we would be able to grow and develop that community center to represent those needs and those partnerships. So we do anticipate um, this is a, a potential catalyst, as it says, for, for growth and services. One of the things that Dilworth does not have inside of our city limits is a healthcare facility or anything of any type. Um, we've been in talks with healthcare providers um, and, and looking for a private partnership to come in and provide something, uh, that, that next step, as we had mentioned, that, uh, that growth piece. Uh, additionally, we've been, um, we have been and will continue to be looking to develop other elements, recreational um, or daycare, as, that's, as, as we stated. And those opportunities would be those private partnerships that bring us together between the city and our, our partners to give the community center that those next steps a, well, more, a more well rounded um, amenity that provides greater services to our community. We have uh, engaged our citizens. We've, um, we've conducted surveys. We've uh, established uh, groups and um, committees to help lead the discussion and lead the planning to ensure that the voices of our residents are heard, the priorities and the needs of our residents are taken in, uh, into consideration and placed as a priority as we look to develop our new community center. Um, there's a, a timeline you can see that 2021, 23, and 23, um, really engaging our community. And then last year was a significant year um, as we presented our project to the state legislature, um, they approved our request for a local option sales tax after reviewing the process that we had gone through. Right? The, from concept and the ideas of you know, what will the community center entail to the inclusion of uh, the citizens' voices to make sure that it's what you know, there's citizen input and they are, their voice is driving the project. And then of course, um, the, the plan and the, and the finances. So the state of Minnesota did give us the go ahead to put our half cents local option sales tax to the voters this November. So we're fortunate for that. 
Um, it does give our, I mean, as we're talking about this, I mean, the state has reviewed our process and our plan and, and given us the thumbs up and the go ahead. And that does provide us um, stability as we, as we look at the financial plan. And uh, just quick numbers, uh, we're looking to generate 6.1 million through the local option sales tax. That's what, uh, that's what the people who can do the math tell me. Uh, so I trust their math. I did not do the math, so you can be confident with that. And then as the county, county knows, like, it's, it's limited, right? The, what we can do is we can only raise the 6.1 million, and when that is paid off and that money is raised, the local option sales tax goes away. Um, when we look at, uh, we'll talk about the exclusion next, this, these dollars are specifically for the community center. They cannot be used for any other project as again, the commission already knows. And of course, one of the things that we like, we want to restate and tell our constituents is that like the funding for the fire station is done, it's secured. Um, so it has, this has no bearing whatsoever. We are fortunate uh, for our fire station. We have federal, we have state, and we have local approval. So that part is done, and this is brand new. And, 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 this, is, and this is where we're at today. Um, and when we're, looking at, and when, when we're looking at the funding, um, our next slide is why the local option sales tax. Um, I guess complete disclosure, um, because I did it backwards. Um, when we were looking at our fire department, I considered the fire department the work. Like we needed to make sure public safety was done. And we secured all of those dollars. We went through the bonding process with the state and the, and the bonding process for, with, from the state was an eye opener because they, opposed, they, they had opposed public safety for bonding dollars. Um, that had been the tradition, that had been the standard all the way up until about last year. And now with that, we chose the local option sales tax because it seemed most prudent for us. And now that we had the fire department funded, the local option sales tax um, will also allow us to use uh, a revenue stream that is more encompassing of the people who actually use the facility. Uh, the local option sales tax will, can come, every, anyone who shops at Walmart will contribute to the funding of our community center. The, there is a significant number of residents outside of Dilworth who use the community center. And again, that was one of the motivating factors and one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, that really um, allowed the state to allow us to move forward is because of the, the usage outside of, uh, of our residents. And this will allow a wider population, those that will use our community center, just like those that use our community center, to help fund our community center. Um, the exemptions are very similar. They're exactly to the exemptions of the state. So there are, will be no sales tax on clothing, groceries, baby products, feminine hygiene products. Those exclusions will apply just as they do uh, throughout the state um, to ensure that it is, is uh, applied fairly. Um, with that, as, as we're going through, another frequently asked question is what if this fails? Um, we will go right, go right back to the community. We'll ask the questions, what did we miss? What did we do incorrectly? Um, right now, we do not have a plan B. Like the voices have, have drawn us to this point. The vision has brought us here. Um, if there's something that we need to go back and look at, we're looking at delaying the project probably three years, um, maybe more depending upon funding revenue. Uh, the state of Minnesota has put a moratorium on local option sales tax. Um, so that will all come into play. Um, and as we move forward, one of the, re one of the ways that we're trying to in include and make sure our referendum does not fail is, is we are doing this whirlwind tour. Anybody who wants to listen, we will definitely come and talk to. Um, we are encouraging everyone to uh, get out and vote and so, um, make their voices heard. Um, residents will be able to vote as to have this opportunity. Um, again, we've had the opportunity and engaged our residents so far. We're going to continue to do that in, in an increasing uh, pace. Um, but this is really tell us where we're going to go and what's going to be our next step is in November. From there, we'll, we'll uh, be able to make the decision as to um, our next step is construction or back to the drawing board. And I'm optimistic that we are going to meet the needs of the, the residents and we're gonna be able to 
keep Dilworth on track. And as we're looking through this, we have engaged a professional firm to help us with the do's and don'ts, to help us with the marketing. Um, they have provided us DilworthOnTrack.com where all the questions can be answered, uh, will be answered. Uh, and it's an excellent tool that we're trying to utilize to make sure uh, that we are information ambassadors uh, for our residents to make informed decisions. And again, <clears throat> unless I missed anything, I do want to be judicious with your time, gentlemen and ladies. Um, well, let Frank go first. My first Gross. question is, since I live in Dilworth, Brian, can I vote on this? I mean, I'm in full support of this thing, but am I able to vote on that? Okay. Mr. Campbell. Yeah, first off, I um, over the years I've been to community center many, many times for many, many different events, and it, and you know, I think it's been a a staple of of Dilworth, and it's and it's quite frankly, I think it's really helped uh, Dilworth be on the map uh, just because of its. Um, all of the events that have occurred there, and I'm glad to see that there's an effort to continue that. I, I'm a kind of a numbers guy, so I kind of want to, I just have a couple questions. In terms of the um, 7.2 um, million, is, is, that the, is that the construction cost projection? 7.1, I think it is. It, it is, and keep in mind that's also a 2022 estimate. These yeah. things are obviously going, going to evolve. We right. did not have a site selected at that time. That was based upon our number that we got from our facilities needs assessment that we did back two or three years ago. Yeah. So I'm sure that number is going to evolve, yeah. and obviously that'll change. Yeah, that it changes obviously, but that's where yeah, kind of our jumping off point. And your and then your current projections based on your your resources to determine how much you would collect is the six point one. So obviously you had a quarter that, million a year. That, there's that. Uh, yeah, two hundred forty-four thousand. I think. Yep. Uh, but, but the um, the difference, of course, then you you've got other sources. But you know, Mayor, when you when you talk about um, that that collection sales tax collection ending when it reaches the six point one million, wouldn't you have the opportunity to have that end at the time the bond payment is done? Because you know, you still on that six point one million. You're still going to have interest too. That's going to be uh, accumulated as part of that financial plan. Right, and ultimately the six point one million, or when the bond is paid, whichever comes okay. first, okay. Is, is, as I understand it. Once, and I, the reason again, that is a very important point for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, the the point I always want to make to our residents is that once the bill is paid, the tax is done. There you go. That's we we do not we don't we don't want the the idea or the misinformation to come out that says well once they pay it off the, the city's just going to keep the tax rolling because no. we yeah. can't um, and and that's really the point of clarification that we want to make to our residents is that once we pay the bill the tax will end. There you go. That's yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. I I just that's that's important for residents to to know that, but it. It, it it doesn't sunset because you've reached six point one million dollars, right? It sunsets when you've paid off the total debt. When we paid off the the bond, whichever comes first. When we right, yep. right. and as like, we had twenty five years or the debt, whichever comes first. That's right. Yep. The questions for the city administrator or the mayor. I just want to. Throw my two cents worth in there. I've been here since 06, and I have many, many, many fond memories of that community center, and you're absolutely spot on. That's, that's been a regional resource, not just a, uh, a Dilworth um, facility. And although I don't have a vote, I'm strongly in favor of this being done. It's just one more... Uh, the expansion you've got out in that part of town is very impressive. I've already been dragged out to the nursery <laughs> and dragged her into the pizza place. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's great to see Dilworth growing out there and it's great to see uh, this as part of it. And I, I wish you luck in your in your campaign to, to get this opportunity to open up for the region. Anyone else? Not thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.
Next up, we have Mark Sloan, GIS and Communication Director, and County Administrator Stephen Larson, request approval for GIS and Communication <coughs> Department personnel change. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, as uh, you may re recall, about two years ago, uh, due to a retirement, uh, we came before this board to uh, ask a shifting of positions uh, within central administration. Uh, at that point, uh, we hired uh, a uh, administrative assistant that was uh, that was shared between the secure, or excuse me, between the central administration and HR, uh, and then also uh, a communications uh, coordinator uh, who uh, helped with the visibility uh, of of what great things are happening here at the county. Uh, not knowing exactly what that would look like, we spent a good portion of uh, the last couple of years uh, constantly evaluating job responsibilities, uh, other opportunities, uh, and here uh, this morning, uh, Mark and I are here. Uh, we've been having ongoing conversations along with Darren uh, Brooke uh, with the different roles and, uh, and have a, a recommendation uh, to bring forward for your consideration. That I'll turn it to Mark. Good morning. Uh uh, we're here today to uh, request a few changes uh, to the GIS and Communications Department. Number one, we're asking to move the Communications coordinate, Coordinator from the Administration Department into GIS and Communications. This would be effective now. Um, there's no cost impact to that because we're just going to slide the position over. The duties and responsibilities will stay the same. Um, that person is going to still be here at the board. You'll see her next week uh, here at the, at the table. Um, part of that creates our... What we're really trying to do is here create a communications team. And right now, uh, the other half of our team is recording this meeting. We have uh, Tim in the other room. He's taking care of that part of it. So then we'll have the two communications people taking care of the board meetings, basically hosting them. Um, we're also going to continue to support the administrator because he, uh, he, he, has, he has access to a lot of things he's doing that require communicating about because that's where stuff is coming from. So we're going to keep keep that person housed where they are in the existing desk where they're sitting and handling those issues and providing some support to the administrator. Probably the biggest change there would be the relationship between the communications coordinator and the administrator changes from being a, an employer and employee to becoming a customer of ours. So we will provide them service. Uh, we uh, also uh, believe that this will make a much better opportunity for guidance, direction, prioritization amongst the communication staff, as well as coordination, allowing them to be more proactive and anticipatory. Um, what we've been doing the last year or two has not been as good as it can be, so I think we can make this better. Uh, the, other, the next thing we were, I'm asking for at the same time is if, the, if this takes a place is to change the title of the GIS specialist to GIS coordinator. Uh, there's no change the duties, there's no cost impact to that. The reason we're doing that is to make, make, maintain some parity between our teams. Um, having, all these having all the communication staff organizationally together, I think will facilitate them to enhance our communications. Uh, the, overall, our social media presence will get that in, enhanced, expand our media relations, and be more supportive of each other. I, um, I have these handy little charts to kind of explain where we are where we're trying to go. So at the end of the day, I think it's gonna be a little bit better in how we handle our information delivery and it will make things a lot more efficient and it frees up a little bit of Steve's time and allows us to better respond to whatever uh, else is happening. Are there any questions? Questions for Mark. Commissioner Campbell. And reviewing this, I, you know, I, um, I don't, I don't, I think it's good that um, Jackie and and um, Tim would, you know, the way that proposal is set up. I I just uh, I just want to make sure that when it comes to um, public communications, I think we had, you know, the intent was that that was between the administrator and Jackie, and and it seems to me that, you know, under the structure, are we. You know, are we then putting you in there too, uh, that where things need to go through? And I, I guess I just want to understand that hierarchy. Uh, right. You know, I, th I think there's certain things when it comes to information that's released to the public regarding issues. I, you know, that was the that was the point in hiring right. J 
Jackie, and it was you know, and working with with Steve. So I just right. want to I, I just want to throw that out there. It's just no, I think that's yeah, you're totally correct. And the way we are configured now, the way at least I understand how it rolls, is uh, Steve is still the spokesperson. We don't have a PIO um, specifically, so Steve is the spokesperson, and I think that. Uh, that relationship's not going to change. We're still going to use him for that. But I do think that it allows us to make it easier for us to provide some support for him. Because sometimes, um, you know, Jackie can help, but sometimes we need other help besides what just Jackie can do. And, that, and this kind of makes it a little easier. It's kind of, what we've been finding is it's relatively challenging to do some of this stuff across department lines. Um, you try to get so that some of these things work smoothly. but. Yeah, I think we'll still keep it just like it is. Steve talks, uh, he's the spokesperson. We'll support him as best we can. My role in this, I, I'm, I'm there strictly, I think, mostly to provide the resources they need, guidance they need. If they need prioritization, things like that, that's where I step in. But besides that, I'm just gonna keep things running smoothly. And I think, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Campbell, I think the, the big thing is, is much like it is now, Jackie just doesn't put anything out uh, on her own fruition. Everything funnels through me before we do a press and, release or anything, and that wouldn't change. Yes, that's exactly, where, yeah. that's exactly what I want to know, because then all of a sudden I saw that there's somebody else that, right. that according to the chart, yeah. he reports to. Yeah. Right. But when it comes to that, that part is still between right. you and, and That is correct. <clears throat> just wanted just to clarify that. For right, and just the one little tidbit here about it, uh, with Jackie, she, her, all of the software she uses now for communications is already being paid out of our budget because we are, have it for some of our other staff. So there's not any change there either. That just, it's just a salary that we're talking about changing here. Yeah, the, uh, I do want to point out, this came before PIC and we approved it and forwarded it on. Um, I think what assures me is we have the two links at the top of the chain of command. We're both endorsing this, obviously. You guys are both accomplished leaders and you communicate well between each other and I think this would only enhance that. We're very fortunate to have Sarah in the mix here um, as a backup on things. And you, you've done a great job, Sarah, in the, in the time Jackie's been on leave and uh, I'm, I'm comfortable that this is a, a good solid decision and a good structure for chain of command. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and, and I would note uh, we're we're only able to do this because of of the talented people that we have, and and uh, I think that uh, uh, it I will I'll say not just to fill in. Sarah has been amazing from the standpoint of uh, being able to take on additional duties uh, and and handle them, and and has been extremely helpful for me uh, and for for our staff. And so uh, we wouldn't be able to do some of the things that we're asking to do here without uh, both of their great work. So. Anyone else questions or comments? Or a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the changes that they plan on making in the GIS. A motion to second. Any further discussion? This one item is Jackie is back to work now. So. Yes, she is. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Any other comments or, or questions? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <clears throat> motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're on to committee reports. We're going to start off with Commissioner Gross. I, mean, I had a meeting yesterday morning up at Halstead with uh, West Central Water District. Uh, it was a very informative meeting. Uh, not that it had much to do with the water district, but there was a presentation about the dairy company coming in in North Dakota. I guess I gave you a copy of, uh, of, of that. I mean, they're talking about bringing in 25,000 cowherd uh, into, the, into the Trail County there. And the reason they gave a presentation was the fact that the, that the water line for the West Central District will be coming from Hills, Hillsboro area and coming we may be utilizing that so they're increasing the size of that line so that we are able to get enough water into the state of minnesota for those area towns that possibly will go on to that connection so 
Uh, if anybody else needs to call, I handed out a copy to everybody of the information on the dairy herd. And I thought it was very interesting uh, what what they had to say. They're talking about building two manager houses on the on the um, complex. They're talking about building apartments on there because they're looking at 100 employees bringing in there. So they need a lot of people there to run that place. So. And along with that, if you want to know what a dairy herd looks like tomorrow and Thursday, the walk on dairy herd or whatever it's called, up at Gary, a little bit south of Gary, uh, they have an open house for the next two days from 9 to 4. So if you're interested in that, uh, to look at it at 4258 225th Avenue. Um, so you just matter driving up there and taking, taking a tour of the place, so... I think Paul and I are planning on going up there tomorrow and checking her out. But other things that are happening up there, the water district, we um, approved that uh, Marshall and Polk County Water District, which is just north of ours, are interested in being part of our meetings too. So we approved them being part of the meetings. They'll be sent schedules and stuff like that. Um, another thing was discussed was the fact that we still need a third member for our, um, we need three from our district, I mean from our county. Uh, so Commissioner Campbell and myself are already on there. We need one more member. So we'll be have to get that because they're sort of waiting for that in order to go to the courts to get that um, committee organized. Uh, the next meeting I had yesterday was with the P Psychiatric res res residential treatment facility. Uh, there's two plans going on there right now, looking for a new, whether we're going to do a new building or whether we're going to um, look at our existing buildings and trying to reconstruct that so we can help that out. And until we get the money, uh, we're sort of going to hold up a little bit in the planning and stuff like that. But uh, we got two good plans available. They gave a good presentation of both plants, so uh, which is sort of at a standstill right now. Well, those were my two meetings. Thank you, Commissioner Krabinoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, during the last Wednesday, we had a monthly board meeting with the Historical and Cultural Society. Uh, main points there were just our um, agency or not our staff updates. Uh, a very good um, executive de um, director report, and along with that, continued fundraising that they do so well uh, for that organization, and received a nice little <clears throat> project grant, unexpected, but $2,500, always helpful. And then we had the election of our new officers, so now um, for this uh, next period, uh, Willie Jacobson will be our president, Deb White. Um, <clears throat> Deb White will be Vice President and Gracia uh, Sanchez and DeCarcy will be our treasurer. Um, that was the main one on that. A uh, number of us will be, um, through the Historical Society, be working at the Humboldt Schoolhouse at the, at the county fair in July. We help out with that. Um, next morning, uh, on June 20th, uh, we had a, uh, along with uh, Commissioner Ebinger, uh, we were, had a virtual meeting with the Suicide and Substance Prevention Group. Um, there was a, uh, I thought, a very, very good, deep presentation um, presented by Melissa Adelson from the Wilder Foundation, um, and she's a scientist with that. She had gone into our area and did interviews with the, they call them champions or leaders, which include students and staff that are involved with sources of, sources of strength, sources, sources of strength, excuse me. And, uh, and this is occurring in um, Moorhead, Dilworth, uh, Barnesville is where uh, most of the activity, Holly is very engaged in it. Maybe uh, some of you have seen some of the write-ups, but again, this is a way of looking at students helping students and staff helping students to have a, a, a good view on 
life and the activities in their life to promote good mental health. And um, they've just shown uh, great, um, great success. Uh, people from all walks, of life, students from all walks of life, where maybe you know it's been a harder upbringing for some than others, but yet joining together and just again having some com commonality of things that young people go through that can affect them. Uh, in positive, neg negative ways in this program hel helps it build toward the positive. I'm t totally impressed. Then there was a second report, um, and we've had this kind of a presentation uh, here presented to us last year by Jason McCoy, and uh, he's been working with the uh, Dilworth Glendon Felton Positive uh, Community Norms. And just to show how sources of strength and also how um, this norms program that they're doing uh, with, um, uh, within uh, Dilworth, the effectiveness. And the point is, when they started this program uh, three years ago, they had done, um, uh, excuse me, uh, surveys of those students at that time. And when it came to, um, marijuana, uh, that was one, um, it was shown that 83% at that time uh, were aware but were not using any, having any marijuana use. After three years in that program, a new survey was done, and now it's 92%. So again, the effectiveness of the program, and, um, and whether it's this or alcohol, uh, you know, but they really show that when the numbers are that high of a student population not using chemicals, um, that they have a nine times less chance of using it if others aren't using. So it was a really high, um, it was a good meeting to be part of and see the positive things going in, uh, in amongst our youth in the school districts uh, where they, you know, interact with each other. Later that morning, went to the uh, monthly meeting for the HRA and the Housing Resident uh, Redevelopment Authority. These are all uh, where we have our housing and, and housing assistance and housing rebuilds for people uh, with mainly Section 8 money, federal funds. Uh, overview right now is that um, the eviction, you know, we're still, we're finally getting to the end of the effects of, of um, uh, during the pandemic where there couldn't be evictions. And some of the damages that were done to the buildings, people not paying their rents during that time, it really uh, put uh, the HRA in a um, kind of, a t uh, well, a very difficult spot, getting a little bit behind. We helped uh, along with that last year here, adding them or, or get allowing them that that levy that they need, and and um, also the grants that we were able to get through social services, Rhonda and and Dara working closely together. Anyway, things are getting back on track. A lot of the money that they received from the state was for rehab of these facilities, mainly in Dilworth and up in Ulan. Most of that work is done, and those uh, units that were. Uh, had really deteriorated or now back in um, full rental state and with good, um, you know, healthy um, uh, tenants and then also security systems being added. So they're going to be coming up with a five-year plan to meet their goals uh, with HUD and they have to, that's part of their accountability of HUD. So that'll be uh, happening. I'll hear more about that next month. Uh, that evening, uh, I had my monthly meeting with uh, CAPLP. Um, the Finance Committee met first. Uh, things are good with cash flow right now. Um, it's always a little unpredictable, once again, when state money comes in uh, or uh, federal money comes in to assist in these programs. But uh, they're always in a good shape cash flow-wise with reserves to fill those uh, um, inconsistency so that the program moves forward in a positive way. Uh, there had been a federal audit on Head Start. 
um, the um, the uh, there were no deficiencies um, at all, and um, in every category under the federal um, federal audit, um, everyone was above the average or the necessary necessary quality score. So, kudos to Cap uh, for the great work that they continue to do and grow. Uh, then yesterday, um, I had food commission uh, meeting again. We've been working on a strategic plan um, development uh, for the organization for uh, partner, uh, food partners in the north, and we had our third session with Dr. Jeff Schatz, uh, who is uh, mediating this uh, converse, these conversations. And we've been working on, and we pretty well got in place a new mission statement, and now we're working on the values and the strategies. So our next uh, strategy meeting will be on July 9th. So that completes my report. Oh, I do want to mention, uh, uh, for all those interests, just a reminder, on Thursday, June 27th, over at M State, we have our longest table event. From 68, 68, I certainly invite everybody here, civic leaders uh, through the Dilworth Moorhead area to attend. Um, and if anybody has interest, we're expecting up to 300 people. And um, if you aren't aware of it or are still wanting to go, uh, there will be room. And uh, just Google um, Longest Table Event uh, Moorhead. On, on Google, and there's a QR code if you uh, can register. Otherwise, I would just suggest show up 6 o'clock in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Campbell. Thank you. Um, on uh, um, yesterday, um, uh, I did attend the West Central Water by phone while I was traveling to another meeting later that day, and the only thing that I would would add to um, Commissioner Gross's report was that um, on the on the expansion of or the potential expansion for the North Dakota side to deal with that dairy, they're also looking at the potential of updating and increasing their water treatment plant. And you know, by doing that, it would also benefit then or, or make it help to um, treat. The amount of water not only for that dairy, but would come across over to Minnesota. So, so that's a, another plus to that. Uh, I, I want to then I we then we had our PRTF meeting. Um, oh, first off, be, like, before that, then in at Prairie Lakes we had our budget committee meeting, and we went through that, and it it looks like we'd probably be looking at a about a three percent increase in our tipping fees that we we're going to charge uh, out of that facility. I think it would go from like $145 to $148, something like that. Uh, it's the proposal there to meet the financial obligations. I'm going to go in a, into the weeds a little bit more on the PRTF than what Commissioner Gross did. Uh, I, I think in terms of transparency and where our conversations have been, I think it's important for for the rest of the commissioners to hear some of the dialogue that we've had. And I'm, I'm, I know that Commissioner Mojo is out, not feeling well today, but I'm sure she'll, she's, she'll either be watching this or, or, or check in. But, you know, the, the planning on that right now, we've been dealing with that through our building committee. And in, that, in the process of that, we've, um, uh, we've had an awful lot of research done. There was some consideration for could it go in the Family Service Center versus building new. And in that process, and, and listening to um, Steve from Solutions, um, I, was, I was just listening, and, and everything that he was talking about in terms of what would make that facility good, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, we already have that. Uh, and we have it on the first floor of the Regional Juvenile Center. And so we, you know, we've been having that discussion a little bit in regards to that. And so before, I, before we went too far into that, then I asked Commissioner Ebringer, who also serves with me on the um, uh, facility for the Northwest Regional Juvenile Center, to, and we met with James and Josh 
Uh, and we did that last week, one day last week, and, and we started talking about um, could that concept work? Um, and uh, what, it, what it boils down to is, is that, and James and Josh were 100% on board with this idea. Uh, and I think that was really important to have our, those people who run that facility. And so what the discussion is, is going to right now, and, and even in our meeting that we had yesterday, um, Stephen from Solutions, he, you know, he was thinking, you know, there might not even be much remodeling that would even need to be done in there. It's just, you know, so I think there's a scheduled tour that we're going to have going in there to look at that. But, um, you know, the outside of that, the where the plan was going and what Commissioner Gross talked about, where we're kind of putting a hold on, is that the the design for a new PRTF uh, and and in all of the needs that would do in a new building, we were looking at having to construct something that would be just be under 20,000 square feet. And, and so what we're, you know, so the, we're thinking, well, okay, well, why not put that there? And then in terms of the non-secure, we still have, we'd still have to go someplace with the non-secure kids. And we, and you know, we've heard from Rhonda, I've heard from Rhonda for years that that non-secure, um, it's, it'd be much better off more in a residential setting uh, than, than in that in, you know, um, institutional type setting. And you know, so now the, the idea was, well, could, you, could we move non-secure and the transitional housing and build that uh, to replace that? And, and of course, you know, there's, that wouldn't require all the hardened uh, type of construction that would need to be done. And so I think there could be considerable savings in terms of construction costs for, for moving that. And, and Josh, who uh, heads in, I, at some point he can speak for himself, but he, he was very excited about that opportunity uh, moving forward. And, uh, and then Quinn Jagger was uh, also at our meeting yesterday, and he was really excited to hear about you know, these potential plans. And one other component, you know, we talked about, we have the non-secure piece, and then within that non-secure piece, we also have that tr transitional housing for our, for our older males. And then we've also incorporated now what we plan on doing with detox in the old facility for creating a women's portion of that. In planning this, we could potentially put all of them together there, and that would then even uh, help resolve some of our demands that social services and public health have in the Family Service Center. So we, there's a, a potential there for a lot of win-wins in this, in this process. And again, it, uh, Commissioner Gross said it quite well, none of this is gonna happen without funding. But at least moving forward and coming up with a plan and coming up with a plan where I know Commissioner um, Krabenoff and Commissioner Mojo have been working um, with our state legislatures, Heather Keeler and, and others on, on a funding program. And, and I think that this really uh, could provide some really good opportunities to uh, you know, I think Representative Keeler has, has been, would be really interested in this um, new approach towards the non-secure um, people in a different type of setting that helps them out. So um, I, I know I've gone into the weeds a little bit on this, but that, it, I, I think it's uh, a direction that, and so ultimately what we, basically what we did yesterday is, is we, um, at this point in time, they've gathered enough information on on a design if we had to build a PRTF new. So we basically said, okay, uh, Klein McCarthy, can you tabulate your stuff and send a bill and, you know, because I think we had a, I think we had, was 100,000, Steve, that we had set aside for? That's correct, yep. You know, so we basically said, okay, well, let's let, you know, if this is a direction that looks very promising in terms of, of, of an idea, let's just not, spend any more on that and get some more information and, and potentially change the resources to um, be looking at this potential uh, option, which, I th which I'm, I'm excited about. I, I think there's really, really good opportunities uh, for all there. Um, so 
I, well, if, if I may, um, to follow up on that, then are have has a request is some type of request made, been made with Clyde McCarthy already, or are we needing to do a board action on that? Or? Well, and I, and again, I, I I think I think what we what we what we did do is is we told um, Klein McCarthy maybe just to let's stop the meter on this on this planning for this other new, and and I and I I think ultimately I don't know I, I kind of want to put that to Steve because I I think ultimately I think it's but that's why I'm putting this out there again I I think right. I touched on this at a previous committee yep. meeting in terms of of the thoughts of using that facility. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, I, I think we're, you're, you know, we're at a point now where maybe we should be um, um, doing something to redirect Klein McCarthy to, um, you know, not not only look at, and I and I think we're waiting for that tour from Steve from okay. from, uh, and once we get that, and then if we can determine what kind of modifications would need to be made in in that facility for solutions. And then ultimately, then have Klein McCarthy switch to what a new non-secure slash transitional housing would look like. Right. So. And if, if I may, just to add, would we include, if we're thinking about this transition as it looks there, do we get DH, DHS involved to? You know, I mean, they they're the ones that kind of have to put some of the approval on some of this at the end of the day. Yeah, that's correct. DHS and, and, and MDH would, would have involvement uh, in that process. And so yeah, I think uh, more of what Commissioner Campbell was wanting to do today was to keep this board up to date. There's many questions yeah. that we have to still ask, uh, but I think uh, I think what, what the board's action here served this project extremely well from the standpoint of saying what's the best path right the, the thought process was as we went in with maybe these two ideas and I think that uh, through Commissioner Campbell's comments and, and ideas it, it brought forth another idea uh, and which I, I do think has uh, a lot of positive things not only for uh, the needs uh, and the number of potential beds uh, for PRTFs but also to better serve a, a, a facility that is uh, softer uh, and more welcoming mm -hmm. to some of the some of the some of those kids that are in that non scare program, Commissioner Krabenoff, I, you know, I, I it, it's it. There's an, an awful lot of legs to the stool that need to, you know, it, it, so we so under the PRTF that that's governed by two different agencies, state agencies, and then what we have with the um, non secure and transitional housing, that is also under all. Under DOC, right. so so we have different agencies, and so we've been asking those questions. You know what? You know, in terms of the DOC issues, I think what we're talking about there. Um, I mean, James and Joss at DOC will, eat, you know, that from some of that transitional housing, they'll they'll they're fine with a regular house. You know, so so there's really some opportunities there, and and. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your work. That's but one of the one of the one of the critical components of that, uh, in terms of the PRTF, you know, you um, you 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 do have some some of the clientele that's in there need to have the type of structure that we have there be, just because of their their um, behavior and I acuity. <laughs> yeah, and where, whereas in the non secure and the transitional housing. You don't need to have all of that. As a matter of fact, you want to try to get away from that in terms of getting them back out and ready for uh, society. So there's some really good opportunities there. But I, I did, it, you know, I, I didn't want to take up too much time. But I, at the same point in time, I just felt it's important to um, keep you informed on where we're going. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Um, 620, I uh, also attended virtually the Suicide and Substance Prevention Coalition meeting. Only thing I have to add to uh, Commissioner Kravinoff's report is we did get a chance to meet Megan Lundberg, uh, who's a new employee at Moorhead Public uh, or Moorhead Police Department. Uh, she's going to be the community resource officer 
basically what her uh, what her position is is to identify individuals within the community who were frequent callers or frequently called on because of mental health issues and try and work with those people to get them the community resources they need uh, as opposed to police officers going out there and trying to deal with a mental health situation where somebody simply needs help and doesn't need any kind of enforcement action. Had a chance to talk to her last Friday at a at a uh, promotion and retirement uh, event that Moorhead Police Department had. She's an extremely accomplished young woman, uh, really excited about this position. I think she's gonna do great things for the community. So welcome her aboard uh, in our area here. Uh, later that day, I was part of the non-secure discussion with Commissioner Larson, or Commissioner Larson. It, I'm sorry, I demoted you. <laughs> County Administrator Larson, uh, James O'Donnell, Josh uh, Swanson, and Kevin Campbell. Um, great idea we've got coming from Commissioner Campbell. Uh, I think it's going to, as indicated, it's going to be a lot of work. We've got to figure out how to get uh, money out of the legislature, which is not something that's easily accomplished these days. They're not funding things that they're already committed to. So hopefully we can, we can work through that. And then of course, we're gonna have three state agencies that all have input on how this is gonna be done. Um, so it's gonna take some work, but I think it's gonna be worth it for the kids that are involved in this and for the region to provide a few more uh, beds for long-term psychiatric treatment for kids which we are certainly short of. Uh, and la later, further later on that day, I attended the library board uh, committee for the Lake Agassiz Regional Library. We approved the final budget and the uh, letters went out. We received our letter uh, for uh, the cost to Clay County and it's gonna be a 6,000 and change increase for us but overall, it was a uh, let me see a 1.77 percent increase in the overall budget. So I think that is a, a prudent um, increase. That just to keep up with salaries, uh, they've done well keeping at that level. Uh, on Friday, the 21st, I uh, was contacted by uh, Emilio Lambeau with. The Association of Minnesota County sees the coordinator for the Public Safety Committee. Uh, we have got a safe and secure courts grant funding that's out there, uh, and he needed um, somebody to review the grants from the AMC. They've asked to have a couple of commissioners. He asked if I would do it, and I told him I'd be happy to do it. There's going to be county attorneys, um, representatives from the sheriff's office, and uh, representatives from the courts also on this review committee. But it is good that we've got an ongoing uh, uh, resources to keep our courts safe. There certainly is a lot of uh, issues out there that need to be, we need to be aware of. And that completes my reports. Uh, Steve, what do you got for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On the 20th, I had a department head evaluation. I also participated uh, MCC JPA prep meeting uh, uh, leading up to our meeting this Thursday. Uh, we had property a acquisition updates. Uh, we talked about uh, haying agreement and, and a contracting action that will be on this week's agenda. Uh, on the 20th, I also participated in the meeting that's been addressed uh, in regards to non-secure uh, detention uh, programming. On the 21st, I met with Dan Molly, Derek LaPointe, uh, got some updates on the Morehead Center Mall project, uh, talked about the collaboration uh, with the uh, the police department and sheriff's department, again, they uh, wanted to extend their thank you in, in working and allowing our sheriff's department uh, to help in, in some of their coverages. Uh, we again talked about uh, coordinating a legislative update priorities uh, as we attempted to do last year uh, to, uh, to uh, work more collaboratively that way. On the 24th, uh, participate in the West Central Regional Water District. Uh, that's been well covered. Uh, just of note, uh, so far, uh, through the through the district formation, we've spent roughly 126,000 of the $300,000 uh, that the three counties have committed. 
yesterday also uh, had, uh, we're in budget season, so we had uh, the pre-budget meeting for human resources, planning, zoning, uh, GIS, and communications. Uh, as you may recall, uh, last week I had mentioned that uh, Rhonda Porter and Quinn uh, we're going to be here this week to do the social service budget. Uh, and while Rhonda's last day uh, of official full-time work is on Friday, uh, she's indicated that she'll come here next Tuesday uh, to, to, uh, to provide, uh, provide that budget. And so we'll have an opportunity to wish her well at that time. Um, let's see, participated uh, in the PRTF a design meeting uh, that uh, has been addressed. Uh, also, just a, a couple notes. Uh, we will have a uh, county picnic uh, here today with 11.30 to 1 uh, for our, our uh, employees' appreciation for the great work that they do. Uh, also, we'll be having a closing on Thursday on the property uh, here uh, on, uh, on north on Northwest on campus. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Brian, you got anything for us? No, thank you, sir. Sarah, this is your last crack. You got anything for us? We want to extend our, our gratitude. You've done a great job, and not just here. I, we get reports back, and you are stepping up everywhere you're needed, and we're grateful for that. Something tells me this won't be the last time we see her here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great job, Sarah. I will adjourn. <laughs>